the objective here is to provide you with a little bit of an overview of the course, the course structure, um, and some of the content. Um, I've got a few slides for this evening. Uh, I'm going to sort of provide a high level overview of the background and sort of conceptual framework of the course, and then um, move on to sharing the course structure. Um, and I've popped a slide in um, uh, that provides an overview, the pedagogical approach, um, uh, like an example from last year's course, um, just so that um, everybody can get a sense of the content, the kind of content that one can expect in the week of November 4th to 8th. Um, as Taryn has uh, reminded, if you have any questions as you go along, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, once I've um, gone over a, a brief introduction, handed over to Taryn for some of the administrative details and information, um, and then uh, another esteemed colleague who's on the call, um, Atula, um, I will then open it up for Q&A discussion. And I'd like to make sure that we have enough time to really get into um, some of the substance and really welcome you not just to ask about the course, the course content and what comes up, but also to share sort of how you are coming to be interested in this course, what this might mean, what does this topic mean for your organization or your entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial journey. Um, so hopefully we have enough time to have a little bit of a discussion, uh, more so than just a quick Q&A. Um, if, if you could, next slide. If you will, if you could uh, shift slides, please. So, fellas, sorry, um, my computer keeps freezing on me one second. I just need to stop and reshare again. Apologies. No, no problem at all. I'll get going while you do so, and you can just... There you go. Um, thank you. Uh, next, please. Great. So, let me just sort of quickly uh, sort of get through some terminologies so that we're pretty clear as to what we mean when we say these things. Um. The course, of course, is social, sorry, systems change for social impact. And really, it's the application of systems thinking and innovation tools to social impact challenges or uh, design oriented ideas that people and organizations, delegates bring into the course. Um, and just to clarify for those who aren't familiar with the terminology, uh, when I say systems innovation, I'm sort of including these four different um let me say dimensions. So systems thinking would be the broad sort of framework of the course and how the course is structured, how the content is delivered, the tools and so on. This is a sort of a um, practice that enables, to, uh, enables us to see the world differently, to change the paradigm, to understand what you do as a system instead of just a collection of parts. Uh, many of you may already be quite familiar with this and I'd like to sort of clarify that we, myself and co-convener, um, Dr. Pumlani Kontwana, have paid a lot of attention to ensure that this course is practitioner focused. And so although systems thinking, systems change, innovation can be quite heady and academic, uh, we you will see later on in terms of the course structure, the slides that I'll share on that, um, that we make a lot of time for practice and reflection and peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, when we say systems change, we're looking at the processes of change that are taking place and asking how we can use those to enable the system to evolve and to really find that transition zone, whatever it is that your challenge is, your organizational institutional challenge might be that you may bring into this course. Um, the idea is to really look at these different processes differently and enable through tools and praxis um, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing. Uh, systems mapping, uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, when I say systems mapping or when I refer to it, uh, or when you see it on so the core structure, we're um, referring to, you can see it as the umbrella reference to tools, diagramming, uh, the use of different models and frameworks to apply uh, systems thinking and change uh, to organizational challenges. And systemic design, which is something that I'll also speak to in a moment, is about the process of defining the required systems components and connections, et cetera, 
that reveal the overall architecture of the system and also enable us to find leverage points and uh, places of maximizing our intentional interventions. Next slide, please. Um, so this is um, also just a good reminder. Uh, this comes from one of the sort of seminal early um, pieces by Donella Meadows, Thinking in Systems, a primer. Uh, remember always that everything you know and everything anyone knows, everyone knows, is only a model. Um, it, getting the model out there where it can be viewed in the sense of the practices in the course is really important in order to invite others to challenge and also provide additionality to our own assumptions and our challenges and our design ideas. Um, I'm going to go through this sort of on the right there. There's just a short sort of one through seven. Um, this comes from systemicdesigntoolkit.org. It's a super helpful melding of systems and design thinking, um, sort of like bringing together these different uh, these different disciplines and recognizing that um, at least at a high level, systems thinking can be super helpful in broadening our problem set and our understanding of the systemic drivers of the problems and issues and challenges that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in our work. And design thinking can often offer some complementarity when it comes to solution thinking and solution building, ideating, prototyping. Next slide, please. And so just sort of walking through this very briefly and why this is relevant is that um, this is sort of, you could see this is the backstage or the back end thinking about the kind of journey or learning journey that we um, hope and aim to achieve through the through the five day course in November. Uh, initially, we really want to discover uh, build a complexity aware or complexity based framing of our systems, the system sectors, organizational um, influences, um, spaces wherein we work, in order to better identify the different parts, the different relationships and key factors that link into a deeper understanding of our work. Um, the listening to the system is all about sort of bringing our lived experience uh, and our um, tangible examples and cases um, um, into the room. There's an emphasis on that peer-to-peer -peer learning, on that mentoring that will be a big part of the course. Um, when we talk about understanding the systems, we're thinking about systems dynamics, we're thinking about building out a better understanding of the deeper underlying reasons that certain problems just seem to perpetuate and, uh, despite all of our efforts. And that links to trying to find um, leverage points and intervention places in our system, in our industry um, that have a higher chance of success. Next slide, please. Um, there's a there's this the, the, you know good to remember here when when we sit defining the desired future good to remember that um, systems thinking systems innovation these tools are useful in the context of our organizations in so much that we're able to define articulate common desired futures um, and find intended sort of shared value creation. Um, there is an emphasis uh, in this course. Um, I think it's on day two or three, but we'll get to that in a moment, uh, around um, uh, uh, backcasting and forecasting. Um, just another sort of way of describing systems mapping of how we got here, as it were, um, and what our understanding of the industry or the sector we're working in is uh, to date, and then using some of the uh, systems thinking tools, the three horizons, uh, futures wheels, et cetera, et cetera, to build out a complexity rich understanding of different possible futures. Um, exploring the possibility space is really where the uh, new ideas that will sort of come in from a design thinking lens around leverage points and how do we develop um, small nudges, small proposals, propositions to shift our work and shift our role in the system. And the designing of that intervention model is something that uh, we will be weaving into the five-day course and we will be creating time for what we'll call uh, systems case clinics and you'll see that in a few moments in one of the uh, next slides next slide please and then finally 
um, the, on the left there, uh, there's a nod to the Three Horizons, which is a fantastic um, complexity-based um, futures or forecasting tool. Some of you may or may not be aware of it, but um, it comes into the course as a, uh, a, a tool or a, a, a sort of a way of being able to nest one's intervention or one's um, systems leverage points in the transition zone, um, which is something that, again, we'll explore uh, later on in the course structure. Next slide. Going to buzz through. Thank you. Great. Um, this is like high, high, high level, just a um, example of the day-to-day -day, um, session plan. Um, what I want to highlight is the re not just the session plan itself, but like why we put it together like this. So um, every day we look to start our morning with mentorship circles. Uh, these are pairings and sometimes triads that we generate before the course starts in order to pair you up with peers, with fellow delegates, and with a whole bunch of presencing tools and systems journaling practices, we encourage um, basically peer-to-peer -peer mentorship um, and so that there's a reflection space to digest and make sense of what we've learned the day before and to prepare ourselves and sink in presence for the day ahead. That happens each day. Um, after the circles, while we're still fresh in the morning, that's where we introduce new content, uh, relevant themes to the theme of the day. Um, the new content includes examples, um, cases from uh, work from the different portfolios at the Bertha Center, whether it's the youth development team or our health systems team, uh, uh, and being able to share content in a grounded um, like case by case example kind of way, so that we can always um, establish the start of the day in uh, something that references work that we can speak to uh, with some uh, you know, with some expertise. Um, what we generally do is we'll break around that time. And when we come back, we'll dig into a particular practice tool that we've highlighted in the content uh, from the first uh, content session. Um, and so this is for a better understanding and mastery of the content presented earlier. So we really want to make sure that um, whatever we share um, in the earlier session is framed with a practice tool that starts to open um, our own um, ideas and our own capacities to maybe apply whatever we've learned for our own organizational challenges or wicked problems that we bring into the course. Um, the, after the lunch session, we dig a little bit more deeply once, so we've now done, we've We've got a case that we're referring to. We've explored and shared and workshopped a practice tool. And then the afternoon session is to dig a little bit more deeply into um, the, how that tool helps us to better embrace complexity, dealing in complex adaptive systems um, that are sometimes super difficult to deal with or work with when we work in silos or work outside of that multi-stakeholder plural approach that systems thinking is very much known for, or very much um, suggests, prefers. Um, and then um, for our sort of final content session, the idea then is to now take the tool, take the complexity away approach and apply it to our own um, examples. So that's when I say a wicked problem, when I say an organizational challenge that the delegate brings into the room, the idea is that we break up into small working groups and work on our um, our own challenges and really apply whatever the tool was that was shared early on in the day. This is what we mean by like a almost like a consulting type clinic. So we'll 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 uh, break back into those mentorship circles of uh, uh, dyads or triads, and then the co-conveners along with the facilitators of the day will be available to assist and uh, uh, work through these different tools, apply them and build uh, a, like a greater fluency really. Again, um, with the risk of repeating myself, we've in the most recent iteration of this course last year, 
we settled on making sure that practice and a practical approach to this content is really where we want to lean into. Of course, we'll be uh, sharing a whole bunch of relevant readings, uh, both academic and gray literature, uh, case studies, and so on um, along the course journey. Um, but we are focusing much more on the practice um, than we are on the academic or theoretical basis of the different tools, knowing that a lot of you, or at least um, um, uh, uh, a lot of the delegates that have applied to this course, both this year and for previous years, are uh, much more practitioner inclined rather than coming from an academic or think tanky uh, point of view. That's where the need is, really. Um, and then we um, the, we we close every day with personal journaling and reflection using similar um, uh, systems and um, presencing journaling techniques as the mentorship circles, but this time it's personal. So it's um, um, each delegate uh, uh, taking time to just distill the lessons of the day. And the idea is, of course, that would then feed feed into the mentorship circle the next day. Next slide, please. Great. So, um, this is an example. So, this is an example um, from last year, and you'll see the uh, you'll see how the didactic um, um, process or model uh, fits in here. Um, the I, I uh, by no means am I saying that the format is going to stay exactly the same this year, but um it won't it won't be too divergent so this is a pretty good example of what one can expect in the context of the week um objectives introductions um early on after registration on monday uh, we'll, we'll walk into a festival of problems so that would be the content section and of course you'll note that the times are slightly different than the didactics but that's because um the way that last year's course um uh had to be arranged uh, um, with timelines and venues had to adjust slightly. But broadly speaking, if the the content section here on Monday is the Festival of Problems, and that's really just a light touch, but still pretty comprehensive way of describing and framing the course in a com complexity-aware lens. Um, and that's generally taken by the co-convener, Bumlani, Kontwana, um, he is uh, currently the founding director of the Ellen Gray Center for Entrepreneurship based out of Stellenbosch University and so um, very much leans into the application of these tools in real world examples, um, entrepreneurship ecosystems and so on. Um, then after lunch, at least for last year, we had, we had uh, that's where we placed the case study focus deepening the understanding of the problem, really falling in love with the problem and committing ourselves to framing our problems better um, rather than racing ahead to the solution. There's that often cliche line, a, a well-defined problem is often better than a badly defined uh, solution. Uh, and then the systems case clinic. So that's the practical application of the learning tools I was talking about. And Tuesday, systems case study of angel investing in East Africa. Um, moving into the forecasting and backcasting. So that would be, uh, now that speaks to um, the uh, the sort of bringing in the, the tooling of the case study, and then later on doing the uh, deeper, sort of deeper dive into the systems language and approaches with the exploring of leverage points and systems work and so on. I'm not gonna go through the whole segment here, I'm hoping I'll be able to just share these slides with everybody in the call so that you can have a deeper dive. Um, but as you can see, morning session is really content-based where we have different speakers, facilitators coming in to share um, something relatable to a particular sector, a particular uh, industry um, that includes an analysis of a problem and the solution and the process uh, through the systems lens. Um, and then after the tea break, jumping into the application of the systems tools. Um, and what we did last year, which we will very likely continue with this year, is ensure that the content facilitators or presenters from the morning are present to assist in facilitating the application of the or whichever systems tool we've plotted to, um, to the day so that we can further contextualize 
and always always come back to um, something that grounds in a particular example sector that hopefully even if you are not a part of that sector say you're not involved in health systems or health systems entrepreneurship that you can still find analogies you can still find and draw different learnings and examples and so on from um, you'll see that we do cover quite a bit about collaboration uh, for systems change coalition building and so on and this is sort of also a nod to the fact that um, really systems work um, uh, like I said earlier it does not take place in silos it takes place uh, referencing um, honoring and catalyzing the power of collectives, partnering, collaborations, coalitions, and so on. Um, there will be um, this year a section on advocacy for systems change, which, uh, sorry, if you can go back again, thank you, um, which will center around partnering with the public sector. So working with different levels of government, um, different levels of civil service and institutions and so on, and recognizing the complexity in a complexity aware advocacy strategies and so on. Um, and then something that's not here at all um, on this um, uh, from last year is that we will be bringing in afternoon, either an afternoon session or optional session after um, after the main content is done on um, monitoring evaluation and learning with a systems lens um we're bringing in that angle because we uh, well mainly because um last year's course we saw that as being a real gap recognizing that having a substantive conversation um about the resourcing of systems work uh, whether you're in the nonprofit sector or uh, running a social enterprise or in an institution, wherever you're coming from, recognizing that how we measure, how we monitor, how we evaluate and how we learn from what we're evaluating and monitoring um, is often not given a lot of attention in these kinds of courses. And we just want to make a nod to that. Um, it is likely that uh, there will be one or two sessions um, that will be optional outside of the main curriculum. And that's just because well, I guess we have more um, more content and more facilitators in mind than we have time in the five-day slot. Um, so that's really just super high level. I'm sorry if I'm uh, going real fast, um, but again, you get this recording and uh, you'll get the slide deck. And hopefully uh, if you have any further questions, you can come back to us. Um, maybe just a small notes is that top line of theme is something that we uh, try to kind of uh, build as almost like a through line or golden thread. So even though we're going through case, tool, deeper dive into systems dynamics, and then a kind of systems case clinic every day, uh, we'll be emphasizing um, each uh, the theme attributed to each day. Uh, and then the uh, venue, uh, this is definitely not to say that the venue structure will be exactly the same this year but we do uh, usually select one venue outside of the graduate school of business uh, at each course so that we have um, some movements some change of context and preferably the um, alternative venue takes place on one of the five days and with a partner facilitator last year it was the Hasso Plattner um, School of Design Thinking um, at Middle Campus UCT. Um, next slide, please. These next slides, I'm going to go relatively quickly. Um, but if you, again, if you have any queries, we'll we'll spend some more time on it in the discussion section. I think it's useful to clarify that um, one of the one of the other sort of golden threads that's always been a part of this course and how this course has been structured is an emphasis on um on individual ch change being a first principle systems change so that's why there's a lot of focus on reflection and on peer-to-peer -peer mentorship in the, uh, the the pairings or the triads and that we recognize that the field of systems change is is much community building as it is the capacity building element or the practice and the sharing of different research and research directions in the course next slide please 
Um, and then this is just one way of uh, it's just one one way of uh, identifying, sharing, um, modeling for that focus on that inner condition. So we're um, making sure that in each day there is a focus on the individual and on the individual learning journey, that there's an opportunity for group learning and the group dynamics, the social processes that go on in the actual class, that the class itself, the the, the session itself is, uh, is its own system, its own learning and adaptive system. And outside of that, then, to uh, recognize that we're nested in our broader ecosystems, industries, sectors, and so on. Um, next slide. And then I probably didn't need to add the slide, but it, but this is just sort of in case we're, I mean, the course is systems change and social impact, right? So it's a systems change um, take on our social impact work. Um, again, no matter where we're coming from, that's really delegates that come to this course are in some way invested in deepening and deepening their uh, social impact work, whether as entrepreneurs, foundations, government agencies, and so on. And so, um, you know, you can pick and change. Uh, so you can pick and choose really um, how you want to define systems change for yourself. But if I just take the top line of this um, bracketed definition, systems change is the shifting of mindsets, mental models, paradigms in order to address underlying root causes through the intentional process and design, taking a complexity approach, living systems approach with the outcome of creating or ensuring different behaviors and outcomes. Um, I mean, you can pick and choose really, but this is, um, I've always found this slide to be a neat way of trying to um, trying to unpack that you know systems change is not just one definition and if we think about starting with the end in mind um the end in mind is an increasing of systems health of ecosystem health of collective competency in finding new ways of um i almost want to say unraveling um some of the deeply complex and difficult um challenge sets problem sets that we come into this course with next slide um, oh, yeah, and uh, this is just, just before I close this presentation, um, uh, trying to make sure that there's enough time for a lot of discussion. Um, you know, we, um, throughout the design process of this course, um, right back from its first um, iteration in 2017, we've recognized that it's super important to lean into the mindset um that really the 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 embodiment of the values that people bring into this course the reason that they come into this course needs to sometimes be met by a constant reflexivity around how our current mindsets uh, our current ways of working our current ways of being trained and being experts or uh, super involved and well versed in the challenges uh, sectors industries where we're working and wanting to improve our social impact sometimes those sometimes the the mindsets are the very thing that can get in the way uh, or at least um, um lead to blind spots and, and um, constrict our practices constrict the imagination of being able to do things differently and improve our practice and so really um although sometimes people um you know uh, think of it as it's the tools and the methods first and then we practice and then that improves the mindset and so on it also goes the other way around and so that reflexivity um of constantly being able to test and critique even what's coming up what's being delivered in each of the course slots is super welcomed and goes both ways so we really want to create a space of constant questioning constant um exploration um, and making sure that we don't just sit in our models and our frameworks in our practices and tools as if um just by doing them just by practicing them we are automatically you know getting better at doing systems change um that really the mindsets and the way that we embody our values is um is is important and consistently a part of how we want to present the course and challenge one another and I think that's me done, uh, unless I've thrown an extra slide in for myself. If you were next slide, please. Oh, I did. 
Um, not going to say too much about this. I'll just leave this in the deck and leave this with you. But just recognizing that the learning, some of the learning principles, I've sort of spoken to all of these already. So in a way, this is maybe just a summary of what I've just said. But um, purposeful reflection <clears throat> every day. We'll have reflexive journaling sessions and so on. Bias to action, making sure that those case clinics are in application and, and, and practice of what we've learned early on in the day. Uh, constantly getting feedback and seeking diversity from the peers in the room, um, from our fellow delegates, um, and trying to use our systems mapping, our models, our futures and forecasting tools to make things as tangible, um, even though we're still just sitting in the room um, as possible so that we can play with new possibilities, uh, frame, reframe, and navigate the uncertainty in our uh, collective ecosystems. And that should be me done. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. So um, thank you for your attention. After all, that's the most valuable uh, thing in any learning journey is our quality of our, our attention. Uh, and just before I close and sort of open up for Q&A, I want to quickly hand over to somebody on the call who I've actually worked with a couple of times this year and yeah yeah i think uh, early on in the year and again more recently um in, in the application of some of these tools uh, and that's atula atula uh, if you're on the call i'd like to just invite you to share uh, what your experience is in applying some of these tools to your own entrepreneurship journey if you give a brief introduction to um, uh, yourself and the enterprise you are setting up and pioneering, and then perhaps just share with us why it is you're looking to come back and deepen your systems change prog uh, sorry systems change competencies in this course. If you could just take a few minutes. Okay, thank you, Pagas. Uh, hello, fellow members here. Uh, my name is Atula Wade, um, Kenyan but based in Rwanda right now. My professional background is in agricultural engineering and I'm the co-founder and CEO of an organization called Baobab Superfoods. So what we're doing at Baobab is we are developing food products out of millet. And how this came to be was essentially an application of uh, systems thinking to food systems, uh, where we are looking at Okay, historically, millet has played a significant role in the nutrition of people in Rwanda and most of the East African region. But in the recent past, it's not even among the top five most consumed food. So uh, just applying different tools of, food, of systems thinking to, to the food environment here, we were looking at what are the possible levers of change? Oh, oh. Is it possible to reintroduce this food, which is one, it's highly nutritious, and in the face of, a, for instance, climate change, there is need for crops that are more more resilient and more sustainable, and and millets in all their diversity tick this box. So, and then at the same time, we realize that food is something very personal. Uh, you can't push people to do what they don't like, especially with respect to food. So then we took a design thinking approach. Okay, what do people care about the most? So from that, with speaking with different people, we we came to the arrival that, oh, for one, they would like something more tasty. They understand it's nutritious. They may also have an idea that it's more resilient, but what they care more most is taste. So part of our process has been finding ways of developing more tasteful products. And so like, this this just uh, brings us to where we 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 are at the very early stages of the business, but simply by application of these very academic uh, tools to the day to day living, we are able to understand what are the possible levers of change and how to approach them with a with a people centric approach. And now, my goal is to even deepen further because I'm leading a team, and at every stage you're facing new challenges, so if I may be able to get more tools and more, more academic approaches to thinking around business, then it becomes very helpful and we are able to, 
to steer change in, in ways that can be more impactful, both from a business and social perspective. Uh, thank you. So. Thank you very much, Atula. Appreciate that. Um, and appreciate also your own continued um, uh, appetite for learning and making sure that your own organization is in a constant reflexive learning process itself. Um, thank you. So, thank you. So um, now over to everybody else. Um, I'm sorry, I maybe took a bit more time than I'd hoped. So we have 15 minutes um, for questions, discussions. Uh, um, please go ahead. We're a small enough group, so please go ahead and um, speak up uh, if you have a question or just throw it in the chat box if you'd prefer that. And then for the final five minutes, I'm going to ask um, Taryn to take us home with a couple of administrative details and reminders around dates and so on. Um, so, uh, any questions from the floor? Nothing yet. Okay, um, while, okay, so I, I see no questions uh, popping up in the chat box just yet. So if you're still thinking um, or processing all of that, um, I know I threw a little bit too much information down all at once, but uh, while that, uh, while you uh, distill that, um, if I can ask Taryn to um, just share some of the uh, further details that I missed around application and so on fergus sorry to step in but there are a couple of hands oh. up yeah oh i'm so sorry i didn't see them sorry about that um if you were if you if you can oh there they are sorry okay um i don't know whose hand was up first but i'm going to go to louisa um, thank you thank you for that uh and thank you for this session because it has set the scene and now I have an idea of what the course will be about. And I can also start to begin to understand how I'll be able to apply it to my work when I go back. And I also like that it's not more theory, but there's an opportunity to apply the tools in the class so that when we leave by the end of the week, you, are, you know and you understand how to use the tools. Then my question would be, I saw on the application that it was asking for um, managers or specialists, where in our case, uh, I'm with my colleague here, and we have uh, two colleagues who have participated in this course previously, and they were not in a managerial role. So we also wanted to understand if uh, that has changed and you are only looking for managers or this course is open to people who will be able to apply it in the work that they are currently doing. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Uh, that's super important to address. Thank you. Um, so first off, no, uh, it is not a requirement uh, to have management experience. However, the reason it's highlighted in the um, application process is um, highlighted and very much emphasized is that we understand, at least from um, uh, hosting this course for several years, that uh, sometimes um, the sometimes one of the best ways to affect um, some of these practices in your organizations is to have somebody who uh, may have a little bit more experience in the organization's practice, strategy, and ongoing processes, and perhaps have a uh, greater chance at being able to apply them in the workplace um, and being able to inf influence the organization or businesses' um, um, ways of working, uh, ways of strategizing, and so on. Uh, however, that certainly does not mean that it's a, um, a barrier. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the, um, I mean, I can give an example from last year, we had 
the CEO of a particular trust in the in the energy space, in the energy sector, renewable space, um, where the CEO came along with two of her colleagues and the three of them from the same organization were able to work on their organizational wicked problems in the context of the course. And that's that's sort of um for us that's um that's a real win because uh, there's just a higher chance of being able to bring that rich organizational understanding and history into the course. Um, and so I guess one thing I would say is for applicants who perhaps aren't managing or leading their organization in any particular way is something that we would then suggest when we see applications like that is to suggest that the applicant um, um, rather than joining the course uh, as an individual necessarily um, uh, integrating whatever the work challenges are with the team that they work with and and bringing that as a collective and being a delegate, being a representative themselves of the broad organization, if that makes some sense. Um, I know Paul's hand was up, but I think Taryn also wants to respond to this one. And I think she's got something really helpful to share on this. Taryn, maybe just, yeah, if, you, if you're responding to this question. Thanks so much, Fergus. And um, again, thanks so much for joining, Louisa and Paul. Salima has told me much about her chats with you. So great to have you on board. Um, in terms of the question for um, the level um, of where you are. Um, so thank you, Fergus, for answering in terms of audience for the course. Um, in terms of what you've seen on the application form, um, that is general data um, that we submit as an audit. Um, for our university rankings. So you would see the question about years of management experience, um, as well as where you fall within the, the professional, uh, you know, working leadership space, senior, middle, junior, specialist, or other. Um, and that's just general data that we collect when we are submitting um, for our rankings um, and our auditing um, for our portfolio as a whole. Thanks. Thanks so much, Taryn. I think I learned something there as well. Appreciate the clarity there. And Paul, um, I can see your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? I'm, I'm submarined. Thank you so much, Taryn, for explaining that. I think, um, yeah, it answers a lot of the questions that we had for myself and Louisa and the kind of work that we're doing because... Um, for us, we are the implementers of the project and the programs in our different provinces. Um, and we're sort of managing the project, um, but we don't have the manager, I guess, title or, or, or sort of to say experience as you put it as a requirement on paper. But um, we were coming into this and even our boss, when she mentioned it, um, we would come into this and apply um, what we learn with systems thinking into the work that we're doing and the programs that we're doing and some of the interventions um, that we would propose um, with the communities that we work with. So I think, um, yeah, we're submarined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I'm watching for hands uh, now. Has Mpo um, gone off the call or I know she had a hand up or or perhaps Louisa was it the same question? Do you know? Oh, that was Mpo. She got kicked out on her phone, so yes, she replied. I was wondering oh. what that, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> was like, Thank you for you that. Go? Thank you. Okay, if there are no further questions, Taryn, um, would you like to maybe share a little bit about the, if there are any other details, applications and dates, and then uh, please still raise your hand or uh, put a question in the button, in the chat box if you, if something comes to mind. Awesome. Uh, I think from my side, I mean, it, that was a nice segue actually into the actual application form. Um, I think it is helpful. Um, so for those who have already completed this process, please indulge us um, for those that, that haven't. Um, so hopefully, you know, what you've taken on from this information session has 
you know, invited you to actually want to do this course. Um, and so when you are ready to apply, uh, you would need to submit your application through the actual um, course web page. Um, so in terms of the application form, I just want to share my screen quickly. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, it's on the, it's up. Yeah. Awesome. So um, from the web page, the application button is on the right hand side over here. And you would need to click on the fill in the necessary pop-ups. It's just your name, surname, contact number, and email address. And once you've completed this, the system will generate a application link for you. Um, and there's a whole bunch of wording, which is basically just telling you to keep your application link safe. You bypass all of that and you would start your journey and click on start your journey. Um, once you've got into the actual application form, it consists of five parts. Uh, the first part being, being your personal data. This is really important to fill in correctly. I've seen some very interesting nicknames, <laughs> shortening of names, um, you know, and it's so important that this correlates with your actual ID or passport that you submit onto the application through the application portal because that's going to feed into how it presents on your certificate at the end. So please, please take care to make sure that this is correct. Um, because once it's gone through the process of moving all the way through to our academic office, um, it becomes very, very difficult to come back from that because the certificates, I don't think many people know, it's not just a piece of paper that you print and there you go. Each certificate, it's made of special material that's uniquely numbered. Um, and so if there's something wrong with the certificate, it, there's another process behind it where, you, where it goes through a burn process digitally and we would have to create a new one under your record. So I really want to highlight this. It's very important that this is correct. It correlates with your actual ID or passport. Um, from there, we move on to disability and dietary requirements. Um, many people don't actually fill this out or to quickly get through the application process, you just click none, none, or, um, don't really give thought to actually what you're answering here. I highlight the dietary requirement because this is a big thing when you're actually on your five days at the campus. Um, we have catering for lunch as well as two tea time breaks. And we often get situations where you may have not have clicked that you're a vegetarian or you know you have a allergy and we wouldn't know because it wasn't on the actual application form. So please, please, if uh, especially for the applicant, the current delegates already, if you're remembering what you've put in and you, you need to correct it, please let me know um, so that we make sure that you not hungry or starving or upset and that we haven't been able to cater for you. Um, so from there, your contact details, your physical address. Um, physical address is really um, if anything happens to your certificate or if we need to send hard copy information to you, um, we can send that through. And then from there, you move on to the next stage, which is where the question came from earlier, employment information. Um, and like I said, this is for our university, feeds into our university ranking purposes. Um, we just want to know how many years of full-time work um, and how many years of managerial work. Um, and that is specifically for the Graduate School of Business um, so that we measure um, what is happening uh, in terms of the weight of our programs and where we need to listen to a little bit more in the market space. For example, if we see that 2022, there was a lot of enrollments from junior management. We then want to use that information strategically um, on what next um, to build. Um, then from there, you move on. This is the billing section. Applicants are quite surprised um, once they've submitted the form and they see my email, or they see my missed call on their phone about the billing purposes. This is particularly important if your company is paying. If your company is paying, 
company details needs to be on this information form because the company has to be invoiced. Uh, what that means, we do need company name, VAT number often, um, you don't have the VAT number or unaware of it. So that is something to highlight um, that you may need when you wanting to apply in your company's pain. And then the account contact information. Um, in terms of finance, our finance policies, we cannot have the same, the actual delegate as the finance contact person, mainly because at the end of a program, the actual person doing the course may not really be involved in paying the course and is none the wiser that maybe the payment hasn't come in. We need to be able to follow up with that billing contact person. So it's very important that you are able to provide that information. Um, and then from there, it's the company physical address. If it's yourself, then you don't have to worry about all of that. You would just click person and just fill in all your details in this section. So once you've completed this section, this is where you will need to upload the ID I was talking about earlier or passport. And then for this particular course, we do request your CV. Your CV is reviewed um, during your admissions phase where you're awaiting your outcome. Um, just want to make a quick note here. You will see certified ID and passport. It doesn't have to be certified. Um, a plain copy will suffice of your ID or passport. And then from there, you are all done. You'll click agree with the statement that what you've presented or submitted is true and you submit your form. Just stop sharing there. Um, so once you've submitted your form, you will receive an email that confirms your submission um, has gone through. Um, and then that's where you would get onto the next phase where I reach out to you um, or my colleague or the program administrator. Um, and then we check that everything is all in order, send your offer letter. And then once you've accepted that, we then move forward with your your invoicing stage. I'm just going to pause there quickly. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Any questions of that or anything odd from there? Cool. All right. So um, for those who would like to move forward, please, the application deadline is looming. It's very soon. It's the 14th of October um, at 2 p.m. SAST. Your application needs to be in before then. Um, and then in terms of payment, um, we will accept payment up until the 25th of October. We will try to be flexible. We understand, you know, often, especially with company payments, there's other background work um, that happens um, that needs a little bit more time. Um, but that's where we work together and, and make sure we keep open information. Um, so in terms of discounts, um, so that's also visible on the web page at the moment, but I know there are many that are working for NPOs, um, NPCs, um, as well as if you have studied at UCT, you have a alumni discount. Um, the NPC, NPO discount is 25%, and your alumni discount, if you have studied at the University of Cape Town, is 15%. Um, and since you attended today, you actually get in position discount if you're wanting to apply if none of the above that I mentioned applies to you um, this today's in position discount is 10 percent so please reach out to me I will drop my contact details in the chat um, I know it was a mouthful it is recorded but we can engage tomorrow <laughs> today if necessary um, and we can take it forward thank you Thank, Thank you, you so much. Are you saying we can apply for those? I think I qualify for all three of the above. So do I get 50%? <laughs> oh, I wish. I'd love to give 50%, but no, unfortunately. Um, so the discounts won't run concurrently. So uh -huh. we would then apply the one that's the, the highest. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I was just no excited worries. that, I mean, I get to get 50%. I saved the organization 50%. <laughs> I understand. Yes. No, unfortunately not. Um, look, uh, just, yeah, delegates, particularly if you have applied already and you know that you qualify for NPC or alumni, let me know so that we can just go through the process and the invoice. Awesome. 
Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for clarifying that. I also, uh, uh, when I hear that, I, um, I find myself putting numbers on top of numbers. Um, but thank you so much. Thanks, Taryn. Thanks so much, if you were uh, and Atula. Sorry, go ahead. A quick question here. Sorry, I can't find my hand raised. Uh, in no terms of the submission of a CV, um, is the course then by selection or is it open? It is by selection. It goes through uh, the admissions board um, and we use the CV and any other information that we've received to make that decision. So, so is there any other information that you require over and above a CV in terms of a motivation or a justification? Yeah, thanks for that, Ken. Um, uh, uh, no, unless we um, follow up with you and ask. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, again, thank you, everybody, for joining this call on this evening. Um, and as Taryn said, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. And if there are questions about the course structure or course content as well, then please also let her know and she can uh, forward that request to me. And I would be too happy to have a follow-up call or uh, email correspondence. But once again, thanks for your time and your attention. And thank you, Evie Weir, again for setting this up. Thank uh, thanks, you. guys. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank so you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um,